good day, everyone. Welcome again to the Wings Radio program, where we hope you will be uplifted and encouraged by what you hear. We want to inspire you through Christ to find the power of God's Word to the challenging times in your lives. Be sure to visit the blog page for prophetic words, updates, and godly inspiration at www.wingsofprophecy.com. Now here's your host, Glenda Lankus. Hello, believers. Welcome to the Wings Radio Show. I'm your host, Glenda Linkus, and today we're going to continue with our series on hindrances on the pathway to promotion. We're going to start with test number three, which is the trauma test. For anyone who is unsure, trauma is defined as a deeply disturbing or distressing experience. Like if someone that you love a lot dies very suddenly, that's considered a traumatic experience. It affects you very deeply. Sometimes, incidentally, trauma can be uh, finding out that a relationship that you believed in is totally false uh, or the people that you thought loved you don't really love you, that sort of thing. That's also traumatic. Now, this series... Uh, is about a series of tests that the Lord revealed to me in the story of Joseph in the Old Testament uh, that are tests that we must pass on our pathway to being promoted or to being exalted by God into a promoted, you know, uh, position like to do His work or a position that He places you in that's part of your destiny, that sort of thing. So since it's based on this story of Joseph, let's just read a little bit about what happened to Joseph. The trauma test for Joseph came when he was sold into slavery. Now, if you'll remember, uh, his father, Jacob, sent him uh, to go to Shechem, where his brothers were, and see how they were doing. Because they, he knew that Joseph would tell him the truth, because he had brought... Uh, his father a bad report before when they were doing something that apparently was bad Joseph was the first son by Rachel who was the wife that Jacob really loved and he was a son of his old age so he was Jacob's favorite and the brothers knew that and they hated him for it they hated Joseph and the Bible says they couldn't even say a nice thing to him they hated him so bad because they were so jealous Jacob had given Joseph a, what's called a coat of many colors he gave him like a coat or a cloak that had like embroidered designs or something on it in biblical times these type of garments were uh, used to show rank and honor so if one son was favored over other sons he was given a garment that set him apart so Joseph's brothers who were all older than him the ones who hated him uh, knew what this cloak meant when Joseph got when he got the coat of many colors which I call the coat of favor because it showed that Jacob favored him when he got the coat of favor the brothers knew that what they feared was actually going to happen that Joseph was going to be given the, the double portion the birth, the firstborn's birthright even though he was not the firstborn he was not the eldest son Reuben was the eldest son but Reuben was by a handmaid or by Leah the wife that Jacob was not in love with and he favored Joseph over all the others. So, it, so Joseph got to Shechem and to check on the brothers, and here's what happened. And it came to pass, when Joseph was come to his brethren, that they stripped Joseph out of his coat, his coat of many colors that was on him. And they took him, and they cast him into a pit, and the pit was empty. There was no water in it. It's believed that this pit was a cistern. And I find it very interesting that a cistern it was was used to hold things for later use. And Joseph was definitely being held for later use, wasn't he? And they sat down to eat bread, and they lifted up their eyes and looked. And behold, a company of Ishmaelites came from Gilead with their camels, bearing spices and balm and myrrh, going to carry it down to Egypt. And Judah said to his brethren, What profit is it, is it if we slay our brother and conceal his blood? Come and let us sell him to the Ishmaelites. And let not our hands be upon him, for he is our brother in our flesh, and his brother were content. Then there passed by Midianites, merchantmen, 
And they drew and lifted up Joseph out of the pit and sold Joseph to the Ishmaelites for 20 pieces of silver. And they brought Joseph into Egypt. Okay, so between lunchtime and dinner time, Joseph has shown up at Shechem and met his brothers. They have ripped his coat from him, which he knew they didn't like him, right? But I'm sure he never expected this. And he's gone from being the favorite son of Jacob, who was very wealthy, to being someone who was just sold into slavery, to total strangers being taken away to a foreign country. If that's not trauma, I don't know what is. I think that probably most of us cannot even comprehend what it would be like to be sold into slavery and carried off in chains to serve a bunch of strangers in a strange land, to be sold at will to other people. Joseph surely was praying, even as he went the 50 or so miles to Shechem to check on his brothers because he knew his brothers were jealous of him and couldn't stand him. He surely was praying to God when they stripped him of his beautiful coat of favor, when they threw him down the cistern. And, you know, he can probably hear them talking while they're eating dinner up there. Who knows? But he surely must have cried out to God because he had great faith. He believed in God. And then the shock came. They pull him out of the sister and give him to all these strangers who put him in chains and then watch, you know, tossing their silver pieces in their hand as he gets carried away by these strangers. I, I cannot imagine that level of trauma to people that took him in shackles to Egypt where they sold him to yet another stranger to Potiphar. Surely, Joseph begged God the whole way to save him from such terrible circumstances. Surely, Joseph wondered why God did not answer that prayer. Why he did not stop that from happening to him. For 13 years, Joseph was a slave. He was 17 when he was sold into slavery, y'all. He was 17 years old. The best part of his life, 17 to 30. Hey, prime time, right? In the last few, he was also a prisoner convicted under false accusation. He probably was praying then, too. Lord, please don't let him convict me. I I didn't do anything to Potiphar's wife. I don't know if I could have kept it together like Joseph did through all of that. But Joseph not only got through it, but he did so with both honor and with his faith and his integrity intact. When trauma happens to a Christian... People often wonder where God is. Unbelievers wonder even more. How could your God do that? God gets blamed with everything, you know. And Satan immediately starts accusing God. There was a time in, I think it was 2010, the Lord had moved me from Woodward, Oklahoma to Princeton, Texas, and my unemployment ran out suddenly. And my grown son lived with me at the time, so I was actually supporting both of us because he couldn't find a job either. And we were staring at becoming homeless and living under a bridge. Uh, The rent day came up. I was positive God was going to do a miracle. I wrote about this in the Wilderness Companion. The days leading up to the rent day, I was like, okay, God's going to come through. He's got a plan. He brought me here. He's got a plan. He's going to do this. And it didn't, it didn't happen. On the 31st, it didn't happen. You know, the last day of February, it didn't, whenever it was. And then the first came, and no rent money. I was freaking out, y'all. I mean, bad. Real, I've never been so scared. I have, I have had someone tell me they were going to kill me, and I was not as scared as I was when I thought I was going to be homeless. And, you know, I was trying to do everything right. I certainly wasn't perfect, but I was trying to do everything I could to live for and to serve God. And one of the things that is so hard about trauma is we really believe that if we're doing the right thing, the right thing's going to happen to us. But the truth is we live in a fallen world and the right thing doesn't always happen to us. And it doesn't always happen to the people around us who are doing the right things either. We hope that it's going to, but it doesn't always. And it didn't happen to Joseph either. And... When trauma comes knocking at your door, you know, maybe you're diagnosed with cancer. Maybe, you know, your child is diagnosed with cancer. I mean, something horrible and absolutely unbelievable happens. And you're doing everything that you can to serve God and do everything right. 
Well, y'all, you have to remember, number one, there's still a devil. And he's he is alive and well on planet Earth. And he's doing everything he can to not only hate on us, which he does 24-7, but to cause us pain and misery and to hurt us any way he can, whether he hurts us directly or hurts us through people that we love. The devil's hard at work to cause us misery. When trauma happens, sometimes we wonder where God is, don't we? When I almost became homeless, I'm like, Lord, what is going on? I'm down here because you've told me to be here. You're supposed to be taking care of me. You're supposed to be paying my my rent. So, you know, you brought me here. Am I supposed to be someplace else? Because you told me not to go to work. And I've been looking for work and I hadn't found any jobs, you know. And I didn't know what to think. I was scared to death. I was so scared. Anyway, God worked all that out. I thought that it meant, you know, somehow I had missed it when he told me that I didn't have to work. And I thought, okay, that's it. i got to find a job. And I looked. I started looking in my career field, which was the oil field. And um, I got a job. The first one I went and applied for, I got. And I found out later that the Lord spoke to the, the beautiful woman who hired me and said, hire her. He said, she said that that had only ever happened, I think, one other time. And she literally, God spoke to her and said, hire her, and told her to hire me. I worked for three brokers over the next year or so before the Lord just told me. I, I took a sabbatical to write the Wilderness Companion <clears throat> because he made me where I was able to do that. And I wrote the book and... Then I said, okay, Lord, is it time for me to find a job now? Do I need to go find another job? And he said, no, it's it's not my will that you work. And I said, oh. So I knew then why the jobs that I had had in that year or so for those brokers had just been so miserable and so unhappy. Because God didn't want me working. And when God does not want you working, there is nothing fun about your jobs. Can I just tell you that? Nothing fun about them. People won't like you. I had never worked on jobs where people just did not like me until I had those jobs. And I mean, people just didn't like me. I was like, Lord, what am I doing wrong? I'm being nice to everybody. But when you are out from under God's will, you're out from under that, you know, umbrella of favor. And there you go. So anyway, I wasn't, I didn't become homeless. We worked all that out. The Lord showed me he didn't want me working. So I quit that job that I did have that I'd taken a sabbatical from. Two years after that happened... I woke up one morning and I'd had a hemorrhagic stroke, trauma number two. And I got a little angry with God when I almost became homeless. I did not get angry with him over the stroke. I didn't really understand it, but I just, I prayed for understanding. And I said, Lord, I must have left a crack open in the door somehow. Uh, because, I, you know, I knew that a stroke couldn't be God, so it could only be the devil. And I said, just please give me understanding about this, because whatever I did that let it in, I don't want to let any more in. And I praised God for the stroke. I didn't do it with a lot of joy, and I only did it a few times. But I did remember to praise him for it, because I knew if I praised him for it, he would bring something good out of it. And he did. Satan will always take the trauma in your life. To, and try to use it as an open door to get an inroad with you. Trauma can wound us, depending on what kind of trauma it is. Um, if you've ever been in domestic violence, which I hope that you have not, the first time that someone you love deeply hits you is such a shock that I don't even know how to describe it in words. I'll never forget it as long as I live. I was 16 when it happened to me the first time. And I'll never forget the shock of that moment. I remember exactly where I was. I don't remember what I was wearing, but almost. And I remember just so many details about it because it was just imprinted on my brain. Um, some traumas just leave such a mark on you. Men that go to war come back with that kind of trauma. But when trauma happens, Satan immediately comes into your head and starts putting thoughts in there. God doesn't love you. He's not going to help you. When, when I didn't know where to get the rent money, that's what he tried to mean. God's not going to help you. You don't do anything for him. He's not ever going to use you in any big way. You know, he just all, you didn't hear from here, him to come here. You were just hearing from, you know, you were just making that stuff up or whatever it was he said. He will come into your head and he will put thoughts in there that are not your thoughts. And try to make you think those thoughts are your thoughts. And try to make you believe those things about God. He's accusing God to you when he does that. 
And he's accusing you to you too. When he told me, you're not worth anything. You're not going to be able to help people. God's not going to support you. You're not doing anything to help people, you know. And I was. I was ministering online, but um, in a smaller, um, you know, amount than I am now. But I was doing my best, and I was doing everything that God told me to do. God was training me. When trauma happens, Satan will try to make you give up your faith in God. God's not going to help you. See? He's not going to help you. He's not going to do anything for you. He tries to discredit God in your head and in your heart. If he can make you see God in a way that is discredited or that God doesn't care about you, you will lose your faith. And then guess what? Then you won't have help because you won't have any faith to receive the help. Then Satan has a wide open door to come in and do some more damage and tell you some more lies. Whenever a thought like that that is against the Lord or even against you comes into your head, he tries to tell you that you're not this and you're not that and you know God's told you you are, we need to do what's called casting down. To cast down a thought, what you're doing is you're rejecting it. Satan, I rebuke you in the name of Jesus. That is not true because God told me this or the word says this or I got a prophecy that says this and I know that was from God. And you stand on it. You can do spiritual warfare with a prophecy if you know for sure it was from God. And you'll know when you hear a prophecy if it was for you. Because you'll feel the Holy Spirit quicken in you. Like in your spirit area, you'll feel it quicken like, hey, that's me. Um, If you get a word about your future or about yourself and you know for sure it's from God, you can stand on it. You can bank on that. Okay? And I do that. When stuff that I know for sure God has told me. I don't let Satan talk me out of that stuff. So I'm like, Lord, I'm going to believe this. I believe that that's you and I receive that. And if it's not you and it never comes to pass, I'm not going to be upset about it. But if, but as long as I think it is, I'm going to stand on it and believe it. And I'm not going to let Satan say it's a lie. You have to grab the thoughts that Satan tries to get you to think and reject them. If you know there's Satan, you reject them. Satan, I rebuke you in the name of Jesus. The Lord said this. Or the prophecy I got said this. And what you're doing that way is you're not only rejecting the wrong thought, but you are replacing it with what you know is from the Word of God or something you know is from the Lord. Trauma is extremely dangerous to faith, but especially to shaky faith or new faith. If you're a new Christian and you get hit with a big trauma, you may have to really struggle to fight your way through that. But even established Christians struggle with trauma. Uh, People that have been in the Word 20 years and something can happen, maybe God doesn't answer a prayer, and they just decide they're going to reject God. And what that comes from is Satan's lying to them in their head saying, see, he doesn't care about you. He should have done this. Why didn't he save you from that? Why did he keep your child alive? Why did he keep your child out of jail? Whatever. That Satan gives them a lie, and they say, yeah, why didn't he? When they do that, they just agreed with Satan, and then, you know, their faith is gone. They're not believing God. They can't receive from God. If we have preconceived notions that if we are doing the right thing, that the right thing is always going to happen to us, then we're pretty much a setup for trauma to take us down. Uh, We do live in the blessing when we're obeying God, but bad things can still happen to us. Bad things happen to Joseph. Bad things happen to the disciples. Paul was beaten, shipwrecked, left for dead, and everything else. Sometimes bad things happen because we are doing the right thing. That doesn't mean that God doesn't love us. It just means we're going through trials and tribulations and whatever. King David, when he was anointed but had not yet sat on the throne, spent 10 years running for his life from King Saul. It wasn't because David was doing the wrong thing. It was just because King Saul had an evil spirit in him. He was angry because David was getting more honor by the people. Just because we try to do the right thing all the time does not guarantee that our life is going to be a bed of roses. Look around you. That should be obvious. But doing the right thing will get us a life of a whole lot more blessing than curses, for sure. Remember uh, the story about the widow in the temple? They got to see the baby Jesus. Anna the prophetess. And there was one Anna. This story is in Luke chapter 2. There was one Anna, a prophetess, the daughter of Phanuel. Of the tribe of Aser, which is, I think, Asher, she was of a great age and had lived with a husband seven years from her virginity. 
and she was a widow of about four score and four years which departed not from the temple, but served God with fastings and prayers night and day. And what that means is not that she lived at the temple, but that her whole life centered around God and serving him in this way. So obviously, this prophetess Anna was a very godly woman with great faith because she spent all her time serving God. Now, you don't do that unless you really believe him, okay? And yet, she became a widow seven years after she got married. Seven years. Been married seven years, and her husband dies. Uh, Most of us would not call that a positive event, right? But she handled it the right way. Apparently, she said, okay, well, I don't have a husband, but I'll have God, so let me go serve God with my time. And look how God rewarded her. Her life was not perfect. She had become a widow, and life for widows in biblical times was pretty tough, y'all. She didn't have the blessings of having a husband. But it says in verse 38, And she coming in that instant, when Joseph and Mary were in the temple, gave thanks likewise to the Lord, and spoke of him to all them that looked for redemption in Jerusalem. She came up and saw that Jesus had been born, and she recognized who Jesus was. It said that she had saw him. That word for saw there literally means that she saw something other people couldn't see. So although she would have had a harder life being a widow, probably had to live with relatives uh, and served in the temple night and day because she didn't have a husband anymore. Look at the blessing that she got. She got to see Jesus on earth. So although her life was not perfect, her life had suffered trauma. She gave a right response and God gave her a tremendous blessing, didn't he? We know from the word of God that those who live godly will suffer persecutions. We know that we'll deal with persecution. We'll be persecuted for what we believe. People will punish us or mock us or make fun of us for what we believe. And as time goes on and on, deeper and deeper towards the end, that will increase. That will get more and more. We know that we will suffer tribulation. We know that we live in a world that we don't belong to because we belong to him. And our home is actually in heaven, not down here. We're in the world, but we're not of the world. People that don't believe in Jesus feel comfortable and at home here. We don't. We feel out of place. And we are out of place. But we're just here temporarily, so that's okay. We're here to do a job. We're here to glorify the Lord. And then we're we're out of here. We're going to be moving on. But my point is this. Trauma is going to visit our lives from time to time. We're going to lose someone suddenly, or uh, when when I was 27 years old in 1987, I lost my youngest and dearest sibling to suicide. That was traumatic, y'all. I was a wreck. I was a wreck. I don't know any other way to put it. I never saw it coming, and I was a wreck. And I, to you know, to this day, still long for him. Still wish that he was here. But these things are going to happen to us. We have to decide what we will believe so that when trauma comes knocking on the door of our life, we already know how we're going to respond. Lord, I hate that that happened. That hurts me that that happened. I'm disturbed. I'm distressed. But you're still my God. Is he still your God? Is he still your Lord if you don't get what you want? If your child that you're closest to gets diagnosed with cancer tomorrow, terminal cancer, or, or dies in a car accident, is he still your Lord? Or is it all bets off if that happens to you? Because there are people who completely throw away their faith if they don't get what they want in their life. If everything doesn't go the way they think it should go, if God doesn't do what they think he should do, they throw away their faith. Which are you going to do? When trauma comes to your life, what are you going to do? How are you going to answer the door? Are you going to answer the door with faith? Because you need to know how you're going to answer it. Because, y'all, we live in the end of the end times. And when disasters strike somewhere near us, you know, when big tornadoes come through the town, when earthquakes happen, you know, when terrorist attacks happen, they may hit closer than just on the TV screen. You may not be watching CNN and see them happening to somebody else in their town. They may hit our town. They may hit your town. We have to know how we're going to answer. Is he still going to be your Lord? In Joseph's life, Joseph had made that decision. He's my Lord no matter what. He is my God, period. 
Job made that same decision. Job got all his trauma at one time, didn't he? Job is believed to be, I think they said it was probably the oldest book in the Bible. I think someone said. <clears throat> then Job arose and rent his mantle. This is after he found all his children had been killed and all his stuff had been destroyed. Rent his mantle, shaved his head and fell down upon the ground and worshipped. He worshipped, y'all. And said, Naked came I out of my mother's womb, and naked shall I return there. The Lord gave, and the Lord is taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In all this, Job sinned not, nor charged God foolishly. That word charged obviously means blamed. Job was basically saying, Okay, God makes the rules. He's the potter, I'm the clay. I don't get to tell him how this is going to go down or what's fair or what's not fair. This is the way it is. Blessed be the name of the Lord. He can give. He can take away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. He worshipped because his, because his mind was made up. God is still God. And God is still God no matter where we are. It's not in the good times that our faith grows. It's not when life is going perfect in those rare moments when everything seems right that your faith grows it's in the hard times that you really get to know him it's when you can't pay your rent it's when sickness has been uh, you know visited on someone in the family someone's dying or something that's when you really see the intimate parts of God that you don't see the rest of the time that's when you see his mercy and his grace and his love in greatest measure when you believe you hope but you believe you really believe that he's going to be Abba Daddy and he's going to take care of you. And he does. You learn so much about who he really is. And he's exactly who he says he is, y'all. Father, I lift every listener to you right now. And I pray, Lord, that you would help each and every one of us to always remember that you are God no matter where we are. You are God no matter what's happening in our circumstances. You are God no matter how often or how much trauma visits our lives. Lord, may we only worship you louder when it visits. May we be like Job and say, Blessed be the name of the Lord, no matter what has happened or how grief-stricken we are, no matter how bad we hurt, Lord, no matter how much darkness has fallen on our doorstep. May we always say, Blessed be the name of the Lord. Thank you for listening. I hope that you have a really great week. God bless you. By the way, for all those who are watching, for the book to come back, Loose from Chains of Darkness and all the curse-breaking books have been taken down for editing. The Lord showed me something that he wanted changed. And I have been working on various projects. Um, and I don't have them edited and back up yet. I will announce on this show and on the Wings of Prophecy Facebook page as soon as they are available for purchase again. Thank you to all of those of you who are interested, who have emailed me and said, I want to buy your book and it's not there anymore. Um, I'm, I'm trying very hard to get that back up. I, will, I don't know if I'll put all the little curse books back up because I have to edit each one of them separately. And I wasn't able the last time I looked to find all the manuscripts. So I may just put Loosed back up and not the smaller ones. Um, but the abuse book will go back up because it's in print, but I don't know about the other ebooks. Anyway, I will get it back uh, edited and back available for purchase as quickly as I can, y'all. Thanks again for listening. Y'all have a great week. Bye. Thank you so much for tuning in to hear Glenda Linkus on Wings Radio. We hope that you've been encouraged and inspired in your daily walk with Christ. You can find more of Glenda's talks on her YouTube channel, Texas Author and the Number One. You can contact Glenda by email at wingsofprophecy at gmail.com or by mail at Glenda Linkus, P.O. Box 127, Princeton, Texas, 
75407. Wings Radio is a non-denominational program and is not affiliated with any other church or non-profit organization. Have you ever gone through a time in your life where suddenly it just felt like your whole life was falling apart? I call these experiences the wilderness experiences. Wilderness experiences are a time of great uncertainty and change. Uh, There are times when our faith is tried and refined. After many experiences, the Lord spoke to me to write The Wilderness Companion, which is a virtual roadmap through the desert times of your life. Find out why you've been led to the wilderness. Find out what the biggest hindrance is to receiving provision in the wilderness. Find out what the seven temptations of the wilderness are. Drastically cut the time you spend in the wilderness by learning how to partner with the Lord instead of working against Him. Every Christian needs to read The Wilderness Companion. It's by Glenda Lomax and it's available on Amazon.com or WingsOfProphecy.com. Amazon.com, The Wilderness Companion by Glenda Lomax. Have occasional strong urges to do the wrong thing, things that mess up an otherwise Christian lifestyle. Is the sin nature rearing up or could it be something else? Spiritual soul tunnels are well-disguised avenues to reach a person who has turned from a formerly unhealthy relationship. If this sounds like it could describe you, you need Glenda Linko's new ebook, Severing Soul Ties and Leaving the Past Behind. For $3.99 at Amazon and WingsOfProphecy.com, that's Severing Soul Ties and Leaving the Past Behind. There's a new book revealing a mysterious 2,500-year-old prophecy. Its title, America, Isaiah is Warning, God's Judgment is Coming. Only now, after all of those years, do His words make sense. They're only directed to this generation, those living in its fulfillment. You will learn what egregious act America continually committed, despite 21 years of repeated warnings our leaders ignored, when the judgment will likely happen and why God has the whole world watching. The horrific events to follow in the secret place of protection for some... Finally, the selected remnant that go into Jesus' millennium kingdom are identified. It's all in America. Isaiah is warning. God's judgment is coming. Find out more and order it now at americasjudgment.com. That's americasjudgment.com. America's judgment is one word. Type americasjudgment.com into your favorite internet browser.